Good day to everyone dialing in and thank you so much for taking the time to share in this interesting and exciting discussion around the topic of how does EGAT position itself to capitalize on the opportunity LNG presents following the opening of the national LNG markets. My name is Craig Henderson. I'm a managing consultant with Advision, which is the consulting arm of the Worley Group, and I have been fortunate enough to be asked to moderate today's session. Uh, I've also been fortunate enough to have lived and breathed LNG and LNG to power in developing economies, and in particular Thailand and across Southeast Asia, and really look forward to facilitating today's discussion. Uh, before we get started, um, today's discussion is hosted by the Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand, or EGAT and brought to you by Inlet Asia. And it, this is the second in an ongoing of series sponsored by EGAT. Um, today's discussion will be interactive. So if you do have a question for today's panel, p p please feel free to send through in the ask a, a question section of the box below on the right hand side of your screen. And we'll answer as many questions today as possible. Uh, we can't promise apologies to get through all the questions because hopefully it will be really stimulating but we'll look to address the more interesting ones that come through today. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in any of Inlet Asia's digital events or discussions, please have a look at the brochure in the handout section on the right-hand side of your screen. And finally, a reminder that today's discussion is just a number, a one of a number of online conversations that will be taking place uh, in lead up to the physical Inlet Asia event in Indonesia next year. Um, as I mentioned, today's topic uh, will, is around how EGAP can position itself. Um, obviously, this is a, a very fast evolving uh, market and discussion, and we've got complexities around dynamics of the existing gas economy, COVID-19 and others. And it is really exciting to see EGAP become the second shipper, which adds a, another, another level of complexity within Thailand. Um, today, we hope to address you know, concerns and questions around the topic and hopefully provide you with some clarity around EGAT's ambitions to how they can, you know, continue to liberalize the Thai gas markets. Um, the agenda for today, um, we will have two introductory presentations. Um, the first from Kunrane Kosavanovic, um, which will provide the context from EGAT's perspective, followed by one from another panelist, uh, Mangesh Patanka, around the Woodmac side. Um, in introducing the panels today, before I move to the first presentation, uh, the, we've got four very exciting panelists today who are going to join me. The first one, as I mentioned, is Kune, Kun Rene Kosovanovic, who is the Deputy Governor for Fuel at EGAT. We also have Kairul Faizi Mohammed, who is the Head of LNG Marketing for Southeast Asia, South Asia and Middle East for Petronas LNG Limited, uh, followed by Mangesh Patanka, who is a Director for gas and LNG consulting at Woodmac. And last but not least, we have Mr. Paul Greening, who is a partner at Aiken Gump Law Firm. So without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Kun Rane for her interesting and um, first presentation for the session. Over to you, Kun Rane. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lani Kosit Wani, Deputy Governor from EGAT Electricity Generating Authority of Thailand. Now, today I would like to uh, present my uh, agenda. The first, I would, I would say that Thailand indicated energy blueprint. So, this is uh, my agenda presentation, and uh, I report to the first agenda Thailand indicated energy blueprint. Print. Uh, so as I think everyone know that uh, we have the master uh, plan for the energy for Thailand. So we would like to start with the uh, TI, TIE Thailand Integrated Energy Movement, which have five national energy master plan. So uh, a major mechanism in energy sector, I would say, I would forget on the power sector. So we will, we, we, we will begin with the PDP power development plan. PDP is a long-term power development, for, development plan, sorry, for the 20 years. And uh, we have an objective to security power de deliver to the Thai people with the competitive price and diversified energy thought PDP. 
emphasized or reinforcing the stability of electricity system, allocating electricity capacity and diversifying uh, an energy source for electricity generation, as well as maintaining the reserve security of electricity capacity. Uh, PDP we formulate by the energy efficiency or EEP and alternative energy development plan AEDP into account of the uh, master plan integrated grouping. And uh, for the EEP, we have the objective to improve the energy efficiency and uh, excuse me. Could you see? Could you see my presentation? So I, I will change for the next slide. Uh, so, so I already talked that Thailand in integrated energy booking. So let me let me continue to the EEP has the objective to improve the energy efficiency and establish the energy conservation target to lower global temperature and reduce electricity consumption in order to achieve the objective of EEP is to promote energy conservation and formulate operation plan of the relevant organization. And next, for the AEDP is the target to reduce the CO2 emission and to promote renewable by increasing proportion of renewable. You can see that the PDP 2018, we will increase the uh, number of proportion of renewable to 36%. So that is mean the government advocate the renewable energy power generation such as the solar, wind and hydro to optimize the indigenous source, resource consumption and uh, that is mean to reduce the energy import and obtain the lower cost benefit from the renewable. While enhancing energy security and promote to use the environmental friendly renewable energy. And for the next plan, we focus on the gas plan. This is a, from the overview of gas consumption share in Thailand. This consists of the power industry transportation sector and gas separation plan. Uh, that is that is, is the uh, gas demand. And gas plan, we also taking our the importation and infrastructure into account. And the last plan uh, for the Thailand integrated energy booking, the oil plan is emphasized. So supporting fuel oil efficiency in the transportation sector according to the EEP plan and also driving the biodiesel right now. And a gas so hall used to be the consist of the AEP, AEDP, sorry. So now I would like to focus on the gas plan. Uh, you can see, so, uh, okay, this slide. Uh, you can see the graph of natural gas is mainly in the power sector allow 58% uh, in the, this year and up to the 67% in the year 2037. And also the power development plan, the version uh, 2018 natural gas remain the major source of the fuel employed to generate the electricity that I will, I will describe for the next slide. And as you may know, in the 2020 Thailand, we have uh, three main sources of the natural gas. The first is 60, about 70% uh, from the gas, uh, indigenous gas, Gulf of Thailand, and the second, 15% uh, 15, 15 we import the natural gas from Myanmar. and. Uh, we also import LG from the overseas about six sixteen percent because of because the domestic gas reserve in Thailand, as you know, that are depleting, while the consumption of the natural gas is increasing, particular, particularly growth demand from the 
60 generation. So the, the major gas contract from Myanmar will be expired around 2030. So LD is the essential energy source to balance demand and supply of the natural gas in Thailand. And in meantime, the government had initiated policy to liberalize natural gas market in the country. The objective of third party asset or TPA is to promote the competitive in natural gas market and to increase the resource allocation efficiency, which result in competitive energy price. So it gets as a major natural gas user in the power sector has been assigned to be the second LNG shipper to support and to take the TPA or third party assets of infrastructure uh, such as the terminal and pipeline network. We have successful import to LNG cargo in the year 2019 and the year 2020. And also with the successful LNG importation, we are confident to pay a key low for the LNG business in Thailand. We have a plan to import the LNG for our own power plan from 2021 onward. Next slide, please. First of all, uh, the regulator or ERC recently approved the three new LNG shippers to support the gas market liberalization after it got successful pilot TPA test. Therefore, other cheaper would able to import LNG after the market is fully liberalization. And I would touch the market liberalization policy. Can, we can see uh, as the key policy to develop Thailand at the region of G hub. Since Thailand is located as strategic location to distribute gas to ASEAN country, this has high demand growth. The government driving the government is driving Thailand to be a regional LNG hub to fully utilize the LNG infrastructure. I will explain the detail in topic name potential LNG hub in Thailand later. So uh, I will touch next slide, please. So uh, just a minute. Uh, so the previous slide. Oh, sorry. Back to back to the slide number five. Number five. Sorry. So back. Back the previous slide, back again. Back slide again. Uh, the number three fuel mix in electricity generation in Thailand. It's a good number. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so you can see that the natural gas will be the biggest portion of the power utility. That is mean the government is driving to liberalize the national gas market and promote Thailand to be a regional as the LNG hub. Uh, so next slide. Uh, So this slide, I would like to focus on the gas market liberalization roadmap for the country. The first phase, now we already mentioned before that ECAP, we are assigned by the government to import the LNG and already success LNG by two cargo in uh, December and December last year and April this year. So clearly the first phase has successful finish and the second phase is under the government uh, reconsideration and it is going to be start near soon. 
you can see the second phase uh, that the structure can be derived for the two pricing method because of uh, we have a uh, we still have the domestic gas from the Gulf of Thailand. So uh, can we name can we name the pool price from the Gulf of Thailand and uh, the second import LNG price separate from the domestic domestic uh, gas price. This is a uh, use for the new shipper with the new contact. Importantly, another thing is to consider import quantity due to the specification of natural gas to be managed issue. Clearly, the government still under the consideration of the clear policy and the price, the process as well. For the third phase structure on pricing method become the unit as there will be much more LNG proportion in the supply, supply side. And uh, can I say that this is a fully competitive market for the natural gas market in Thailand. So next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the next step or uh, the developed market for Thailand, we are going to the LNG regional hub. Uh, the LNG regional hub is the place to exchange, sell and buy LNG in physical and storage of the LNG to distribute LNG. It's not only the domestic, but also the international customer. Uh, so uh, that is mean the place uh, to exchange, the physical exchange where there are the reloading, storage, LNG, bunkering, packing, break rule and break brow and small scale LNG and cooling down service. So uh, you can see that PTT LNG have structure on this line and uh, we are now have a five cheaper to unload the tank and uh, PTT LNG will distribute more than more than uh, the regasification for the power pan. Next slide. So this slide, I will show the potential LNG hub in Thailand. Uh, as the growing gas demand in ASEAN country, the geographic location of Thailand is well which for distribute gas inland country such as Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand, as well as potential LNG demand in Thailand. We uh, will increase the 6 MTPA to 26 MTPA demand in Thailand in the year 2037. Therefore, is this a foreseen as the country's opportunity to develop regional LNG hub? It's not only the strategic location of Thailand view with uh, LNG infrastructure, but also LNG trade volume in the global keep increasing annually with more supply availability and flexibility in LNG contact. So next slide. This slide I will show ECAP low in Thailand gas market liberalization. So uh, as you know that ICAT now we are the state on uh, we in charge of the electricity general generation and the transmission. For the law of ICAT in the gas market, uh, so uh, recently we has completed the TPA system testing and is in the process of setting up LNG business. Get has planned to establish the new business venture that relate to our core business, which are the power generation, transmission, fuel gas, uh, where we intend to extend the activity along with the full LNG value chain, such as gas to power trading and also upstream investment. Next slide. So this slide, it get, uh, we will take the LNG business opportunity. As I mentioned above, natural gas and LNG importation has a huge 
potential in Thailand under government policy to liberalize the gas market along with the potential to development LNG hub. So now we see that this opportunity and want to anticipate to extend our business to field business, particularly the whole LNG value chain. We get has plan to establish LNG business unit in accordance with the uh, National Energy Policy Committee resolution uh, the year 2017. We have a lady unbundling LNG business account from our core business. Then we have planned to spin off the LNG business from the core business of ECAT and we aim to pay a key low not only in domestic and uh, also the international market. For this time, of the LNG business, we plan to import LNG for our own power plant first and followed by the seeking of the opportunity to expand the domestic market. And next step, we target to invest in the upstream market and to develop the international market eventually. Uh, so that is my presentation and uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention and we welcome uh, your question please thank you thank you kunrani very very interesting discussion there and i'm sure there'll be lots of stimulating questions from that uh, again just a reminder to our attendees if you want to ask uh, questions please please feel free to type them in the uh, ask staff a question box and we'll we'll get moving with those um, for our next presentation, I'd like to invite uh, Mangesh to, to switch on your video and also share um, yours and, and Woodmax's views on, on the situation there. So thank you, Mangesh. Thank you, Craig. 2020 has been a roller coaster year for spot LNG prices. Towards the start of the year, when the pandemic was onsetting, there was a decline in oil prices and that meant that there was a consequential decline again in long term oil indexed prices which fell to sub us five dollars per mm btu but what was keenly watched again was the spot lng prices where some deals were done in fact even lower than two dollars per mm btu now if you see towards the latter half of the year especially winter deliveries Spot LNG prices have risen to $7 per MMBTU, which is higher than the long-term LNG prices. So it's been a volatile year for LNG prices with historic lows witnessed in the start of the year and prices again going above long-term LNG prices towards, towards winter deliveries. Another notable feature of this year has been the resilience of LNG demand. When the pandemic onset towards the start of the year, a key question for many stakeholders was how much demand destruction is going to happen and how much time will it take for demand to come back to pre-COVID levels and start growing again. But now, sitting in November 2020, if we look at the stats, it seems that LNG demand in fact is going to see a positive growth even in 2020. We forecast LNG demand in 2020 to be around 370 million tons which is a 3% increase from 360 million tons in 2019. A key reason for this demand resilience was the fact that several countries used the flexibility on their alternative gas sources. For example, China nominated downwards their pipeline contracts. In a few countries, we saw that domestic discoveries uh, domestic discoveries were either pushed forward for a delayed production startup or domestic production was curtailed in some of the cases. So clearly we saw that the countries and the corporates were trying to take advantage of the lower spot LNG prices. And they have done that by making nomination downwards or adjusting their domestic gas productions, etc., which has meant that LNG demand has stayed resilient and we will in fact see a positive growth even in 2020. It may not be as much as it was anticipated earlier, but we still will see a 3% growth this year. Moving on to the next, so what the, the, this slide shows effectively our view on LNG demand for the next decade, i.e. until 2030. Before I go into the futuristic view, let's see what has happened in the last five years. 
Between 2015 and 2020, LNG demand has grown by around 115 million tons. That's a big jump. Just out of curiosity, I tried to check back that when was the last 115 million ton growth witnessed prior to 2015. And I saw that it took almost 10 years for that 115 million ton growth to happen. So that happened really between the period 2005 to 2015. Whereas what we have seen here is that 115 million ton has really grown in, in the five years time frame. And a lot of it was supply driven, which I will come to in, in the latter slides. Looking at the futuristic view here, we forecast global LNG demand to grow from 370 million tons to around 560 million tons by, by the end of this decade. And a lot of it will come from China, India as, as they are growing markets, but Southeast Asia will also play a pivotal role in that LNG demand. By 2030, we expect Southeast Asia to be greater than 10% of the global LNG demand. And in terms of the absolute growth between 2020 and 2030, a quarter of that growth is going to come from the Southeast Asian region. Southeast Asia not only includes the existing importers like Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, but we will also see new countries in the region joining LNG Importers Club. We have already seen Myanmar joining the LNG Importers Club this year. Vietnam has its first LNG terminal uh, under construction right now, which is expected to be operational next year. And Vietnam will start importing LNG in 2021. We expect similarly Philippines to start importing LNG beginning 2022. So clearly there are new countries from Southeast Asia joining the importers club. There's growing demand amongst the existing countries like Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, etc. And that overall will mean that Southeast Asia will play a critical part of that LNG demand growth going forward. Next slide, please. So this shows the supply side of the story. Now, as, as we spoke in the previous slide, there was a significant increment in LNG demand between 2015 to 2020. And a lot of that demand was driven by supply availability, which resulted from FIDs on liquefaction projects that really happened between 2010 to 2014. So this was really the FIDs that we saw on projects in Australia, like Gorgon, Ictis, Wheatstone, or the first wave of US liquefaction projects like Sabine Pass, Freeport, etc. So all, all these projects took FID between that 2010 to 14 period and have really contributed to that growing LNG supply between 2016 to 20. And that's what has been absorbed by the importing countries. Now, if you look between 2015 to 2018, the amount of FIDs that have happened have been very low. And this clearly means that the supply, the incremental supply that we see between 2020 and 2024 is going to be impacted because projects that took FID during that 2015 to 2018 period effectively are going to come online between that 2020 to 2024 period. And clearly we see that less FIDs had happened during that time. 2019 was a record year for FIDs. This was in part driven by the fact that very low FIDs had happened during 2015 to 18. So we clearly saw that stakeholders were getting, con uh, were getting concerned during that period that the market could tighten between 2022-2023 if FIDs were not happening. And we saw buyers supporting a lot of new liquefaction projects and that did result in a record amount of FIDs happening in 2019 with 70 plus million ton capacity actually reaching financial close. Then came 2020. Because of the pandemic, uh, the lower oil prices, what we have seen is no FIDs have actually happened this year. But what we do need to note is that though a FID has not been officially announced, Qatar, for Qatar, the writing seems to be on the wall. They seem to be moving ahead with their 32 million ton expansion. And we clearly see that with uh, activities on the upstream side, as well as the shipping fleet orders, etc. Next slide, please. So then let's look what, what do these demand and supply dynamics mean for the overall supply demand balance. As you can see there, what we have done here is we have overlaid on the, our global LNG demand projections, the supply coming from operational and under construction projects. So projects which have already taken FID. And 
it clearly suggests that despite the lower number of fids happening between 2015 to 18 despite the covid pandemic impacting some of the construction schedules for the fids that happened on the liquefaction plants in 2019 there is adequate supply in the market available to meet demand until around 2025 and if we were to actually overlay again the 32 million ton expansion that qatar is looking forward to then that would mean that the market appears balanced until around 2027 2028 so that's clearly driving a competition amongst suppliers to lock in end users and when i say suppliers here it's not only the new liquefaction projects it's also the existing liquefaction projects because a number of those existing liquefaction projects have their contracts expiring in the coming decade and it means that they will need to either roll over those contracts with the same end users or if the end users are not rolling over those contracts at the same volumes then they will need to sign contracts with new end users so there's clearly a competition amongst existing liquefaction projects as well as new liquefaction projects when it comes to contracting lng with end users can we go to the next slide please and this competition clearly means that prices are facing a downward pressure if you look at the chart there it shows how oil indexation levels on lng contracts have fallen over the years in 2011 2012 prices were very high which was driven to a great extent by the unfortunate fukushima incident which happened in 2011 but post 2014 as we saw oil prices collapsing demand stagnating in a few countries we had the prices going down in 2018 there was a slight flip back because as, as i referred to earlier 2015 to 18 was a period when less fids happened so there were concerns that time around markets tightening in 2022 2023 which meant that buyers supported new liquefaction projects even at slightly higher prices so we did see a small flip there in terms of prices in 2018 but once that 70 million ton has taken fid in 2019 once there's clarity that qatar looks to be going ahead with their 32 million ton expansion we are clearly seeing the long-term prices dropping again for 2020 if we look at some of the recent uh, qatari deals that have been reported clearly the oil indexation levels are in the low tens so this clearly suggests that there is a significant competition right now amongst existing liquefaction projects as well as new liquefaction projects to lock in end users the market environment clearly seems to be in favor of buyers and that augurs very well for new buyers like egat who are looking to go out in the market to lock in lng because this looks to be a right period where they can get the right price from some of the suppliers as well as they may be able to extract better contractual terms in to, uh, in, in in respect to flexibility etc so that's just about trying to set up context for the panel discussion that will follow on EGATS LNG strategies to, to come fine. Craig? Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Mangesh. Uh, interesting as always. Um, I would now like to invite uh, our other panelists to switch on their cameras so we can all see what they look like um, in this new world. We all do things virtually and it's a lot of fun. Um, and I'd also now like to give our other two panelists an opportunity to provide a few opening yeah, remarks linked to the topic. Um, Paul, I see, I see you're up, you're up and running first. Maybe I'll hand over to you for some opening remarks from from your side about what you see related to this topic today. Sure, Craig. Thank, look, thank you very much, and um, and and thanks to uh, thanks to Inlet, and thanks also to to Ega for putting this webinar together, and a, a particular thanks to Kun Rene there and my fellow fellow uh, panelists for taking the time to discuss Thailand's energy transition and and the opportunities that it presents. Look, I, I think I'll keep these introductory remarks brief, but but there are some really interesting points that we'll look to cover today. Um, I think first and foremost. Um, we're at a very exciting stage of development of the gas market in, in Asia. The, the economics of gas use are increasingly favourable when we compare them to alternatives such as oil and coal. So the incentives to move away 
from oil and coal to, to gas have, have never been stronger, uh, at least in the shorter term. We can speak a little bit more about that later. From a regulatory perspective, uh, I, am, I am a lawyer, so I will focus on this a little bit, but there remain some challenges to gas market liberalisation in Thailand, but, but progress has certainly been made as uh, evidenced through Kun Rene's presentation. And, and there's been, um, um, there are also a number of other markets in the region that we can, we can take a look at as examples of, of, of positive developments for gas market liberalisation. Um, we, we should also consider, I think, how the industry has responded uh, to COVID-19 over the course of this year and, and what, if at all, um, will be the lasting changes um, that stem from that in the context of risk allocation across the LNG value chain. Um, and in particular, what, what are buyers uh, of LNG now, now looking to, to achieve under their LNG sales term in, in, in light of these developments over the course of this year? Um, but I look forward to the, uh, to the spirit of discussion and hand back over to you, Craig. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. And some, some very interesting concepts and topics brought up there. I think I really like the idea of looking at, you know, some of these analogous challenges and how we've solved them in other parts of the world. So really look forward to some of your insights today. Um, now I'd like to pass over to Carl, who's obviously sporting the very, very um, fashionable Petronas Mercedes-Benz shirt after Lewis Hamilton's win. So Carl, over to you for some um, opening remarks linked to this topic. All right. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, webinar. And thank you, Enlit Asia, for organizing such a very good uh, platform for us all to share uh, EGAT's ambition to, uh, to support the LNG ambition in, in Thailand. So for Petronas, uh, in particularly, we have done a lot of uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, businesses in Thailand. And we have take, we have also gotten uh, the privilege to also work closely with EGAT with regards to their uh, spot requirements uh, under the tender that we issued last year. So I would like to congratulate Kunrani and EGAT uh, organization for successfully del deliveries of those two cargos. Indeed, it was a, a milestone that uh, being celebrated uh, across two organizations and. We in Petronas are ever ready to support uh, EGAT in regards to uh, prolong our relationship uh, between the two organizations. Um, so come back to the main questions and also the main topic that we want to see here today or discuss here today is basically to position EGAT as the uh, as a new player in, in uh, Thailand in the uh, uh, gas market. So I think the main uh, the main question would be then as a leading power producer, EGAT has its own uh, captive demand that needs to be protected uh, due to its uh, leading position as the main producer. So there's a balance between, uh, you know, value to be had in terms of competing and at the same time, what would be the security of supply of Thailand in regards to the natural gas. And the depletion of the Gulf uh, production has and will have an impact on the, on the Thailand energy security. So positioning EGAT as the leading producer and also the second shipper in Thailand will definitely help the nation of uh, Thailand to manage the uh, balances, the imbalances between the natural gas from the pipes and also the LNG. So it's going to be a very exciting time for EGAT to uh, be the new player and how it manages the balance of supply and also to create more demand. So I guess that's the what Kunrani researched to be having an EGAT whereby it becomes a fuel supplier not only for its captive demand but it will also uh, uh, propel itself to be the, the gas uh, buyer and also gas supplier to other um, in the other industries in, in Thailand not only in power generation so we look forward for the opportunity so we can also further discuss uh, there are also challenges that uh, uh, Paul has uh, envisaged earlier and so Mangesh also explained in, the, in his presentation earlier. So look forward for the uh, conversation in short while. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Carol. And some very, some very interesting and, and thought-provoking topics there. Um, so what I'd like to do now is, is quite simply get into some of the questions. Um, a lot of questions coming through, which is great. And again, to the attendees, please keep those questions coming. We're going to try to get through as many of these as quick as possible. 
Um, so I might start with um, a question for yourself, Kunrani. And obviously, there's a lot of interest around, you know, EGAT as a as a buyer of LNG. And a, a simple question, probably in two parts, that's come through is, uh, what are some of the key criteria you're looking for in an LNG contract? And a follow to that, you know, will this be a tender type uh, arrangement, or will it more be a bilateral type arrangement? So if you could address some of those concepts, please. Thank you, UK. Uh, regarding the con the term and condition of the LNG contact, uh, we we are looking forward to uh, go to the spot market first, and uh, we we are not to commit the long term contact. We also, because of, because that I mentioned, we are the new shipper, so uh, we try to uh, collaborate with the domestic demand uh, supplier as well. And, uh, and as ECAT, we are the state owned. So the tender process we will do by, by the tendering process. We like a two cargo that we already successful, the two cargo we, we do by, we done by the uh, tender process. Right now, we try to advance for the bilateral, but not yet for the state or right now. Thank you. Thanks, Kunrane. I appreciate that. Um, maybe one for, for you, Mangesh. Um, quite a simple question. And you know, you showed some of the, the demand dynamics and you showed the, the drop in price. Do you think LNG has bottomed out in its price? <laughs> Okay, that's uh, that's an interesting question, and to be honest, a very very difficult one to predict. Uh, what I would say is, see, there are two things to watch out from here. Uh, one is how many FIDs do really happen on liquefaction plants in the next one to two years, because if in addition to Qatar, we do see a number of other projects taking FID then that effectively means that the oversupply in the market increases and that's definitely likely to put a downward pressure on the prices so fids i would say is one thing to watch for when when it comes to uh, what's the prices going forward but the second thing i would also uh, say is to look at what's the oil price because ultimately assuming that oil indexed contracts stay a dominant part of the lng value chain then what these uh, suppliers are signing is x percentage of oil price and that x percentage of oil price needs to cover their break even cost so if we are talking about oil prices of around 60 dollars per barrel say, which many of the corporates have announced that they are taking a view then at say a uh, 10 and a half to 11 percent indexation which we are seeing today and prices ds prices at around seven seven and a half odd dollars we think the projects can break even. That's like a break even price of many projects. But if oil prices fall below, say, to like $35, $40 per barrel level, then that obviously would make it uh, challenging for those projects to break even, which means against that FIDs will get impacted. So in, in a nutshell, I would say it's not a straightforward answer, whether it's, it's the bottom of LNG prices, whether it will go further down or further up. What I will say is that there are factors to watch out for here and the FIDs that happen and the oil price levels will play a critical role in where prices go from here. Perfect. Thanks, Mangesh. And as always, giving us the right indicators, but you don't have a crystal ball. I think if you did, we'd, we'd all be millionaires. Um, so so maybe now shift shifting a bit to the concept of the LNG hub in Thailand and maybe a question for yourself, Karul. Um, you know, Thailand is envisioned to be the LNG hub, but how will that, in your view and with Petronas, actually shape demand growth, both in Thailand and in the wider region the hub's looking to, to supply to? All right, thanks, Greg. Uh, for, for us, we see the market of Southeast is going to be the next uh, exciting place. First of all, it's nearby to Petronas' uh, supply points. Uh, we've been to do positioning is very near to, to to most of the Southeast Asia countries. And the demand side, uh, we see there's a lot of uh, potential that's going to go up to 37 million tons uh, in the future to come. 
and what uh, Kurani has mentioned, Thailand in particular is going to be around 26 million ton uh, market very, very soon uh, in the mid of the, uh, this decade. So that has propelled a lot of uh, opportunities for people to go in, but without challenges, it, 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 with, with challenges definitely. So as an energy hub, it is a very good concept for for the importers and also for the suppliers to work in terms of providing the security of each country and Thailand in particular. Um, but for us as Petronas, we see this uh, hub can only be developed if, let's say, there's a few uh, uh, factors that needs to be addressed. First of all, hub can only be a real hub if there is a liquidity and also on LNG volume and transactions. So, so far, we have not seen this. The reason being is uh, there's not many transaction has been uh, done in, 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 in the region. So it has been a long-term contract most of the time. And the bit of, uh, what do you call this, uh, spot cargoes being imported to Thailand in particular. And the uh, readiness of the infrastructure. So Thailand is definitely envisaged that they can do a lot of reloads and storage and everything. So all those uh, good stuff needs to happen first before uh, really hub uh, uh, positioning can be uh, can be adopted in the region. And I guess the next uh, point is the third party access. Uh, that is also uh, a very key uh, factor that needs to be considered if let's say uh, Thailand is going to be the, the next uh, what do you call this uh, hub in the region. And I guess th they are moving towards that and we are excited to work with uh, as I mentioned EGET and also other cheapest that's uh, already been granted the third party access. The last but not least, uh, because uh, there's also the clear government policy, so a long-term uh, government policy also needed for a hub to be uh, workable. If it is none of those uh, factors and none of the government is supporting this thing, so the hub will not be uh, you know, in achievable in that sense. So for Petronas, uh, we are working towards a lot of um, of, of these factors. In fact, we are experiencing that also in Malaysia uh, or under third party access. So uh, there's a lot of growing pains uh, that needs to go through. But I guess uh, by having a collaboration with a, with a supplier, with a, with a buyer like EGAT, then uh, this, these pains uh, can be worked on. And I guess that would be then the, prop, the, the, the main factor. Then how do we manage between uh, uncertainties and make it into a certain uh, contractual rights that meet, can meet the demand and also the requirement by EGAT in that sense. Perfect, thanks Koran. Some, some great, great topics there. I, I particularly liked your last one around almost the partnership arrangement and we need to work together as an industry to, to create this hub. Um, I might, I might uh, move over to Paul. Um, Paul, from a, from a regulatory perspective, so what, what do you think are the, some of the main key challenges to this gas market liberalization? And then within the context of Thailand and lessons learned, where do you think EGAT's you know, big role could potentially be to solve some of those challenges? Thanks, Craig. Uh, look, firstly, I think it might be helpful just to the audience here to recap on, on the current regulatory environment um, for gas in Thailand. Um, in terms of gas, PTT, a listed company but under state control is the it's the dominant entity um, which has historically controlled the gas sector from both a, a domestic production perspective but also uh, as yeah, an entity yeah, yeah. that imports pipe gas from Myanmar and Malaysia as well as, um, as of course LNG. Um, of, of course the granting of the LNG import licenses to EGAT um, and also to, to Gulf Energy earlier this year and, and the other steps um, taken as highlighted in, in Kun Renee's presentation are all very important and significant steps towards liberalising the, the gas market. Um, as um, as Kun Rene noted, the awards of the gas import licences to third parties was a, was a result of the establishment of, of, of codes to, uh, for third party access, which allows other companies to be able to access gas pipelines that were usually under PTT's control. So, so with that in mind and looking forward, what, what are the challenges from a regulatory perspective? Um, I, I, at a high level, I think the main challenge appears to be around this concept of regulatory intervention uh, in Thailand. We've seen uh, efforts towards privatisation, of course, with PTT and, and, and EGAT and power sector, and, and the recent moves to open up the competition for LNG imports. Um, but that is still some way off for, for a fully liberalised market. Um, energy regulation in, in Thailand has, has to date favoured 
uh, this government intervention approach where the government maintains close supervision and control over the sector to, in, to ensure energy security really is the driving uh, um, of I seem to have lost you there, Paul. I'm not sure if the other panelists have lost him also. Change to remove monopoly positions of PTT. And notwithstanding the recent change to allow third party participation in LNG, the regulations still provide for a dominant position for PTT as both an importer and a trader. The Thai government continues to regulate the price of gas and, and PTT can rely on this as a price floor. So there is certainly, um, there's currently no open access to gas pipelines for transportation of domestic and imported gas. Um, and proper market design around third party access, including uh, a you know, strategic approach to unbundling uh, infrastructure, separating out uh, regulated gas transportation from commercial sales mm -hmm. activities and establishing um, concepts like capacity allocation mechanisms and also uh, of course creating a, a simple and as clear as possible uh, tariff structure are, are all challenges that are, that are going to need to be addressed going forward. Um, th there's, there are other issues as well which we see not just in, in, in Thailand but in other markets um, around consistent access to, to information and information sharing across the various um, state regulatory agencies. Um, so the, the um, Transparency, basically, and availability of, of data are going to be uh, essential um, for building confidence in, in market players, uh, and, and also ultimately to prevent discrimination among shippers. Uh, and this, of course, if done correctly, encourages access and competition and ensures efficient operation of the market. Um, so where do we look to for lessons? Um, look, every country has its own challenges and opportunities, all of which uh, are going to be heavily dependent on domestic resources and the political landscape of the particular country. But generally speaking, in emerging markets, the challenges are, 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 tend to be the same. Um, they relate to restructuring the wholly government-owned uh, energy co-monopolies, bundling infrastructure and providing for third-party infrastructure access. Political turf wars uh, are all, also all too often uh, represent a barrier, as does consistent and transparent information sharing, as I mentioned. Um, also, a, a, you know, a lack of resources within the various ministries to implement liberalisation measures and to monitor and vet new industry participants are all issues that, um, to varying degrees, are, are trying to be addressed by uh, developing uh, gas markets across the region. Um, so let's point to some good examples of uh, liberalisation um, where we can perhaps uh, learn some lessons. Japan, uh, of course, as we well know, deregulated its gas market in 2017 establish a gas market surveillancing uh, commission um, as a regulatory body, uh, launch the Japan OTC exchange in 2018 as well. Um, we can look to Singapore um, uh, for unbundling of natural gas transportation um, uh, and competitive activities with imports being granted through licenses. Um, it has the gas network code regulating transportation activity, but that provides non-discriminatory access to infrastructure. Um, we can also look to China. China, um, as people may have seen in the press recently, has been making some strong in inroads toward liberalisation of their gas market, in particular with the formation of their system uh, pipeline operator, Pipe China, um, where they recently completed the trans transfer of pipeline assets from three of the NOCs. Um, but yeah, th th that's sort of the developing space. But uh, I guess when you look at challenges in the developed world, th they're also there, but they're, they're different. Um, primary complaints that you hear in, in markets like the EU and the US, they relate to different issues around things like social and environmental matters, providing for carbon credits, for example, to end users, uh, consumer abuse by, by industry and, and loss of control over what form of energy a, a government can impose on its people. Um, so all of these challenges really have to be viewed um, uh, also in light of the, the, the dramatic changes to the energy market over the course of this year. Um, and I think, you know, looking forward in terms of developing these policies, um, we have to have a pretty good grasp of what is a recovery going to look like. Are we going to have a V-shaped recovery and, and return to normal? Hopefully that's 
the case and, and with the recent success of the vaccine trials, maybe we will be there uh, in Q1 next year or getting close towards it. Um, but we've got to consider other uh, um, uh, roads to recovery as well here. Um, perhaps governments are going to take away some really hard lessons from this pandemic and effectively push back uh, against globalisation, um, look to um, our domestic production of, of energy using whatever resource is at their disposal. And perhaps that means coal comes back into the picture. Um, another option that, that, that people speculate about is that we may see a quick return to normal, but a, a fundamental policy shift uh, at the government level towards greener investment uh, of stimulus dollars and accelerated transition to renewables. Um, so look, these are all questions and, and, and be interested in other people's uh, thoughts on that. But um, thank you. Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Paul. And, and as, as always, a lot of great insight there. I, I particularly like the idea of transparency. And I think in a lot of lessons I've seen over the different industries and different countries that transparency is key. And it's not obviously looking and putting aside the, the commercial complexities, but, but it's just that willingness to look to partner and almost open our books together to, to come up with solutions here. Um, another interesting question that I've noted come through, and it, it ties into some of the things Paul was mentioning around the energy mix. How does um, LNG, and I'd be interested, Mangesh and maybe Karul, your views on this, you know, should we still be looking at LNG as that transition fuel with renewable energy? Um, you know, we talk a lot about coal displacement. Is, is LNG still our, you know, ramping buffer to wind and solar and in the Thai context? So maybe Mangesh, your views on that first? Sure, I'll, I'll go for it. So see, I mean, I think when it comes to a competition from renewables, uh, what I'll do is probably segregate the time period uh, between uh, this decade and, and a post-2030 era. And our view is that in this decade, uh, I mainly until 2030, it's going to be difficult for your renewables and battery combination uh, to compete and come to a grid parity cost levels, firstly. And second, also the fact that uh, it's difficult to create a massive scale of renewable capacity that can really meet the incremental power demand that we are expecting in many of the countries. And hence, that will mean that in order to meet baseload power, if you are not doing coal, then you only have gas LNG as an option. Because as I said earlier, firstly, renewables may not be competitive, especially when you talk of battery. And secondly, creating that massive scale of renewables may be very difficult. But when we talk of a post-2030 era, I think there could be a different way of looking at things. Because in many of the countries, we do expect a renewables plus battery combination uh, to come at competitive cost levels, which means it will start having an impact on LNG. However, having said that, we still see it as a very difficult, uh, very, we see it very difficult that only renewables are going to get built even in that post 2030 period. You will need to have gas LNG plants also being developed simultaneously. The only change I would say is that post 2030 period, maybe we see more renewables capacity coming up and the gas LNG capacity that is being developed is, is reduced. Whereas in, in the period until 2030, we are probably going to see a lot of gas LNG to power capacity come up because that's just needed to meet the incremental power demands in most of the countries. Thanks, Vangesh. Yeah. Uh, Karul, any, anything to add on that? Yeah, certainly uh, the opportunity to go for RE is uh, hot on everybody's plate and I guess uh, the carbon footprint, there's a lot of companies, IOC and particularly in Petronas, we do have a vision to also decarbonize our LNG and to have a much more, what do you call this, cleaner, more cleaner LNG, even the clean uh, LNG is one of the cleanest fossil fuel around. But uh, the threat of re renewables is definitely there, uh, that it will have an, a place in its uh, energy mix. As you can see uh, right now, even in most countries, we have coal, we have hydro, we have uh, nuclear. So all those uh, fuel mix is still there. And we've been in the, what now is 2020. So I don't think so. It will have 100% renewables is going to be replacing LNG. And uh, let's say, for instance, in Malaysia, we have about 20 gigawatt of power. I can't imagine how many, how big of a solar farm we want to do to replace that, right? 
so there'll be a certain mix that's going to be happening and that's why and the combination of that uh, still is going to be prevailing in the years to come and in our view there's also a space for new generation that can be happening in terms of taking re plus lng because until the batteries the technology is fully mm -hmm. developed so the sun can only shine during the day so the moon doesn't have any enough uh, power to even power up your so the combination probably is, is it has to be there for even the next decade uh, to, to sustain this lng demand so there's a collaboration again that's why we talk about it this is something that is going to be disruption to our market definitely as an lng supplier but we take it as a as a way forward in terms of how do we then collaborate between the the power producers that uses uh, re with lng is there any way that we can also drive down the cost is there any way that we can integrate with this uh, with this new technology that we speak of under renewables and you have to bear in mind as well we what why we we say this is because all power producers for instance eget as well they have already invested billions of dollars in installing this capacity so they they are not about to uh, remove their capex spending just because there is a uh, renewables around the corner right so uh, we believe that uh, until and until when the the investment is fully amortized then probably there's a big push on taking this uh, to a new power plant and everything so the same argument we talk about coal why is it coal still there right coal is still there because people are still burning and using it because the power plant is using coal you can't simply just turn off the power plant until it's finished it's uh, shelf life so all those things the factors need to be considered when you talk about renewables but obviously uh, it is going to become and it's going to come very very fast and we understand that but I think the combination between LNG and uh, renewables is going to be the next way forward in a sense. And last but not least, we also see LNG as a niche market that you can penetrate. Yes, power producer maybe you can still uh, replace that with renewables, but bear in mind, gas usage is also into petrochemicals. So when you talk about petrochemicals, uh, renewables cannot replace that. So LNG can still play a very important demand in terms of other usage of gas, that's uh, other usage for energy that's still not replaceable by, by what you call this uh, renewables. So and now we're talking about marine fuels, right? So marine fuels is also a, a, a new thing that uses LNG now. So that's another area that uh, can also boost up the LNG demand. We talk about that because uh, then LNG is have a very niche. Uh, Prosper, prosperity in terms of uh, new market segment, which is the LNG transportation. It's very, very, what, one or two percent of the world uh, transportation um, is being used in, in, in gas or so LNG. So we can't have a solar panel, probably we will have uh, later on a solar panel and also EVs that's going to be there. But I guess uh, that's also will take uh, uh, another, the next decade to really materialize. Thanks, Carol. I think I think very well put. Two two key takeaways from me there is it's called the energy transition for a reason, and we need to slowly transition away from what we currently have. And the other one, clearly, we can't use moonlight to power our systems, which is unfortunate, obviously, um, on a lighter note. Fortunate for LNG, though. <laughs> um, maybe shifting gears a bit because I've seen a few questions come back in towards the the LNG contracting side of things. So, Paul, maybe I'll put it to you. You know, what in your view are some of the important terms and conditions around these contracts within the, the Thai, you know, context? Yeah, th thanks, uh, Craig. And I, I think it's um, I think it's important here, here to note at the outset that notwithstanding everything that's happened th this year and, and in the markets that have been a direct result of COVID-19, I think it's important to point out that the LNG market has for a number of years been been shifting and for the for the reasons mentioned before towards a buyer's market, particularly particularly for good credit rated rated buyers. Um, and, I, and I think compared to 10 years ago, you know, the classic um, flexibility provisions, destination cargo flex, timing associated with exercising destination flex, um, increasing prevalence of, of cancellation rights, um, quantity tolerance, both, both upwards and, and, and downwards, are all now more beneficial to, to buyers than, than, than they 
they once were. Um, and, and I think now, you know, looking at lower for longer environment, at least over the next decade, I, I think I think the buyers and, and buyers like 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 EGAT, um, especially those as I said with good credit ratings, will will, will seek to seek to take advantage of of the current environment. Um, I think you know there's, there are a couple of areas of the the, the sort of I guess the medium to long term SBAs where you, you you'll see fairly spirited uh, discussion around um, some key provisions uh, over the coming over the coming years. I, I think firstly just focusing on on COVID and what what, what that has has done. I think that brings really into for the issue of um, force majeure um, from from a buyer's perspective, particularly excuse me, particularly a DES buyers. Um, they need to consider how to deal with the fallout of, of events similar to uh, a COVID-19 or, or, or some other form of pandemic or major global disruptive event in the future. Um, yeah, th there are some difficulties with, with claiming force majeure due to um, force majeure being derived from downstream issues in particular, such as local market demand collapse. And, and that's what a lot of the, the, the current disputes and arbitrations are, are, are moving towards assessing that issue in the context of force majeure. Um, so I think what will happen is, is buyers will, will, will try to be really clear around that risk allocation now and, and try as much as possible to push that risk um, further up the supply chain into the, into the sellers. Um, I think the second area um, that you're going to see perhaps an accelerated uh, window of discussion around is, is on cancellation rights. Um, and, and obviously in the face of COVID-19, greater flexibility on cargo cancellations would have uh, really helped out a number of the buyers in in in, in China and India, in particular, um, and and I think you know that that will have significant benefits to buyers if that can be negotiated. Similar argument, I think you'll you'll see being made around increased DQT flexibility and and shorter notice periods um, for exercise of those rights. Um, price review clauses will come under, um, I think. Uh, uh, increasing uh, scrutiny on, on both sides. Here, I think you'd expect to see buyers wanting shorter periods between price reviews in order to, to minimise risk of being in an, an unprofitable position. Um, th this was probably on the cards before COVID, um, to be honest, but I expect that, that it now you know, will be particularly so. If, if some of the other kinds of flexibility that I just mentioned, if, if they can't be incorporated into, into contracts. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate that. A lot, again, as always, lots of insight. Um, you, you mentioned COVID-19, and I think no panel discussion will be complete without mentioning it here. So, Kunrani, I'd like to pose a question to you. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has had a terrible impact on countries all over the world. Um, significant demand destruction, you know, activities that restrict their citizens, um, and really trying to get everything under control. And from EGAT's perspective, you know, how does EGAT prepare to cope with the situation in LNG supply and the management of those LNG supply aspects? Thank you, Chris. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is really unfortunate event uh, for the global economy and uh, Thailand as well. And uh, we are the state or represent of the government, uh, representative government. We fully we support uh, we support the government policy to subsidize the electricity bill for the business and the, uh, the people, the Thai people. And uh, and uh, if uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation seems to be slightly impact on the demand, electricity, and eventually the national gas demand as well. Um, so it's not much impact for the demand natural gas in Thailand. Uh, so that we get, uh, we try to have this opportunity to balance uh, the decreasing of demand and demand natural gas and electricity. Uh, so we try to uh, balance the flexibility and to adjust the condition of the uh, electricity demand decreasing. So uh, after we already uh, consider uh, tend to increase of the demand, 
So now we try to uh, wrap up the volume of the LNG import to Thailand uh, for FP8 volume, right? Uh, uh, the last year, we plan to import uh, a lot of LNG because of uh, the increasing of natural gas demand. But now after the COVID-19, we adjust the volume, balancing the uh, minimum take for the domestic gas and the import LNG to the country. It's not matter uh, the duty of the take or pay for the country. So we that uh, we get the other state owned to like uh, to uh, subsidize the government and subsidize the Thai people, and we plan and as well as we plan to import the LNG by uh, the op uh, by the suitable number of the LNG recording. Thank Thanks, Kun Rene. And I, I, I know there will be many happy Thai citizens to and be very happy <laughs> with you on that subsidy of, of the electricity bill. Um, maybe maybe again I'll, I'll shift uh, the, the focus somewhat and maybe be so bold as to, to put COVID aside completely. And Mangesh, I've got a question for you and it's come through in the panel chat here. You know, what are the the dynamics of a lot of these gas market, you know, going through a liberalization? What does that actually mean on the liquefaction side of the industry? You know, we, we've talked a lot about the demand side changing. What's what what does that mean for the supply side? Okay, yeah, no, good question. I'll say gas market liberalization effectively is doing two things. One, it is bringing new buyers to the LNG negotiation table. Second, it is increasing the number of LNG buyers in a country. And when we talk about these two aspects, I think there are two crucial points which financiers and liquefaction project developers look at when they are actually trying to achieve financial close. You know, one is the credit rating of the counterpart. So when a liquefaction developer is developing a project or the financiers are looking to put their money in, the credit rating of the buyer is a critical factor. And when market liberalization is happening in several of these countries, not all of those buyers are going to have the same credit rating or the same financials as the existing importer or the aggregator may have. So that definitely may put a challenge on deals happening. And one, one, of the, one of the ways we are seeing that is uh, getting addressed through is by intermediaries stepping in. So if you look at some of the liquefaction projects that took FID in 2019, say the Calcasieu Pass or Mozambique LNG, we did see that deals are being done by portfolio players or traders. So effectively, these portfolio trader players or traders are going to buy those volumes on their books and they are then going to slice and dice and sell those volumes to those ultimate end users who may not have as high as a credit rating as may be required by the liquidation developers or the project financiers. So that's that's on the new buyer coming to the negotiating table. In terms of the number of buyers in uh, a country increasing, I think it raises market uncertainties from the liquefaction project developers or the financiers perspective. Because earlier when there was only one importer or aggregator in a country, then effectively the developer or the financier was taking a view that all the country demand is going to be met through this specific aggregator or importer and he's not going to face much competition. So there's less uncertainty on what is the demand for that aggregator or importer going forward. Whereas now with liberalization and the number of importers in a specific country increasing, obviously there's an element of market uncertainty and the developers, financiers need to think that could he face competition going forward because new importers come in and could that lead to problems in he being able to resell those volumes into his respective domestic market. And to be honest, I mean, the, the, the way that could get addressed, I mean, one is the contract durations getting reduced. I mean, again, that is something we are visibly seeing on new liquefaction projects. Long term contracts, which historically we used to be 20 or 25 years, 
have come down now to around 15 years and even on projects where financing was to be taken on billion dollar capex liquidation projects we have seen contracts being to around 15 years and that being accepted by the financiers so i think in order to address that market uncertainty question we may see that the contract durations actually get reduced because the project developers financiers will see some element of uncertainty given given these liberalization initiatives which will bring more number of buyers to the table mm -hmm. thanks mangesh again uh, insightful as always and i think it's it's interesting to see and excuse the pun we, we need things to become more liquid in the liquid natural gas market um a little bit mindful of time so i'm going to pick two two of the questions that really jump out at me coming from our um attendees today and the first one's uh, directed at Petronas, so I'm going to guess that's Karul here on the panel. Um, it's quite a simple question. How do you see the role for Petronas for future LNG de demand growth in Southeast Asia, especially in Thailand? Um, as uh, the panel also alluded, there's a lot of uh, demand opportunity in Thailand. And uh, what Kunani message earlier was uh, quite clear. 25 million ton is quite a chunk, uh, a big chunk of uh, demand to be had in uh, one particular country. So we see Thailand as the uh, next uh, exciting place as well that's uh, going to be uh, consume a lot of uh, gas. Reason being is um, currently the domestic demand is uh, facing a lot of uh, pressure. Uh, I mean domestic production, that's what I'm referring to. The Gulf of Thailand production is uh, in decline and uh, also 6 million ton is going to come which already coming or previously uh, from Myanmar, that's going to impact as well. So where does that uh, this energy is going to come from? Yes, we can talk about renewables as uh, we alluded earlier, but obviously the big chunk will come and will have to come from LNG. So uh, we remain bullish on the Thailand market and I think uh, it can be reflected by EGAT's aspiration to become uh, the next uh, big uh, player in the industry in Thailand in particular, but the other shippers, the two, three shippers has already been applying the, the same uh, license and already got the license for them to import the LNG. And that is also a, a very big uh, milestone that uh, the, the, the country is preparing himself in terms of uh, to, to support this liberalization in the market. For us in Petronas, um, we are quite fortunate because our supply notes is very nearby. And just to uh, for everybody's benefit here, uh, we also have commissioned our uh, new uh, FLNG uh, in Sabah, uh, which is the, the, the coming FLNG 2 that's going to come next year, hopefully. And uh, that is also going to add into our supply nodes in, in the region. So, in fact, Petronas, we are well positioned to supply any demands that are going to come in Southeast Asia. But there are challenges. Uh, I would like to reiterate that. Um, the, 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 because South Asia is mainly built up on islands and archipelagos and also uh, geographically it's going to be a bit of a challenge. So uh, in terms of uh, let's say for instance uh, earlier this year we managed to also help uh, our friends in B Power and Sintik to deliver their own first uh, LNG into Myanmar. So how do we do that? By also addressing the pain points that they look at in terms of how do we then manage the, the shallow river in Yangon River, for instance, you know, shallow depth. So we managed to work with them uh, in terms of providing the solutions and also what kind of uh, flexibilities that we talked about earlier. Greg mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, sorry, Paul mentioned about, you know, the TNCs and everything. So those are very important for us to create the demand and so to support uh, the new players in the market. One size doesn't fit all. And because of our experience for the past 25 years, we've seen a lot of people and supporting a lot of companies that to, to start their own business. So we do have a lot of uh, flexibilities and also uh, opportunities to work with them. So that's why most of them are able to have a long term relationship with us because we look into how do we then cater for their for their demand in particular. And I, I would like to also say that um, uh, in order for us, to, for Petronas to support this, we also need to work closely with the government of uh, each country. So then uh, that is also an avenue to, to educate and also to have a guest advocacy. It's very important to understand that that's not uh, uh, what you call is uh, the, the main value would be cost, definitely. 
uh, people talk about pricing, people talk about uh, this thing, but ultimately, if you don't have gas or LNG into the country, then what's the point of talking LNG, uh, price, right? So it has to become security also. Uh, supply security is also important in, in the region. So that's why we have to marry between between these two uh, factors effectively. Price, flexibility, and also security. So all those things needs to be in uh, work hand in hand for us to make sure that uh, it's going to be a sustainable business for the buyer and the seller. So and Petronas, we 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 take a very very high uh, um, what do you call this um, high value in these uh, factors. You know, we need to make sure that the buyers do have a sustainable business. At the same time, we hope also the buyer can understand that the supplier also needs to make money. We cannot also uh, we invest in a lot, and I think Mangesh, Mangesh expected uh, already explained earlier, right? Billions of dollars, so it's not free. So we need to make money. So help us to make money, and you can also make money. Everybody's happy. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Carol. I like Thanks. that. Every, everyone's happy. Everyone makes yeah. money. Everyone makes money. Yes, uh, so everybody very, needs some money. Yeah. Very, very important points, and a, a lot of great content there. Again, mindful of time, and I would like to pass back to Kunrani for one question that's come through, which I think is really interesting and actually quite a nice question to summarize a lot of the discussion around the topic today. So coming back to the gas liberalization policy in Thailand, um, what is EGAT's role as a, obviously a major gas you know, consumer in the country? What is your role to support this liberalization effort? Thank you, Fed. As I mentioned before, ECAT has been assigned to be the second cheaper to test the TPA regime and uh, court authority access, such as the terminal and pipeline court seen uh, under the NEPC, National Energy Policy Committee, uh, assigned ECAT in uh, June, July, sorry, July uh, 2017. And uh, in order to support the gas market liberalization scheme, we have successful for the two cargo and thanks for the bitterness. <laughs> I think uh, we will be happy to make a lot of money as well. <laughs> so now after the successful of the LNG importation by get uh, the country, we are now going to the next step of the or the second phase. This is a transition to the gas market liberalization is really in, important step before we are going to the fully uh, competitive gas market liberalization. Now we uh, challenge picture for the country. We are how, how to balance in the domestic gas still have some a lot of uh, volume and uh, the LNG importation because of a uh, as you know that the specification of natural domestic gas and the LNG is much different. So we have to balance the specification for the power utility is the biggest portion. And uh, now uh, we will, so now this is a review set by the government, how competitive gas and LNG price is like a regulation that the government will create and transparency to set uh, is not only the price, but also the pro proportion of the new shipper should be imported on to the country. All this be carefully considered by the government and set many things uh, fairness for the regulation. So, so we strongly believe that we'll be able to contribute the national gas market to accomplish the full liberalization and uh, we are ready to go to the LNG business for the international market as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kunrina. I know, I know I'm certainly excited about that. I think EGAT's obviously got a very important role to play in this. And by all accounts, it sounds like you really have thought this out and really looking for the rest of the industry to help and partner and let's, let's figure out how we can do this together. Um, again, my, mindful of time now, what I'd like to do is, is pass back to each of the individual panelists and just give you an opportunity to perhaps present, you know, what a final key takeaway from each of you are. Um, so may, maybe I'll start with Paul. Paul, if you could give a, a bit of a, conclu a conclusion remarks along with the key takeaway. 
Thanks, Craig. I'll try yeah. to be quick. Um, on, on the liberalisation point, look, I, I, I agree with everything Kun Rene said. I, I think we are seeing some fantastic steps being made in, in Thailand towards achieving uh, gas market liberalisation, but we do need to ultimately find a balance between government control of the energy market and pursuit of energy security and the, the need to develop the competitive open and transparent market. Um, from, from an energy marketing perspective, I'd say the two biggest takeaways for challenges uh, that participa participants in Asia are facing um, navigating pricing challenges, pricing challenges and finding a, a, a tailored pricing solution that, that works for both buyer and seller. Um, and then navigating through the requirements for increasing flexibility is also uh, a particular challenge for, for um, both buyers and sellers. And, and finally, I, I think you know, we picked up on um, this a little during this presentation, but I think to end on a really positive note, I, I, I'd like to say that the LNG industry is, is an extremely inventive and adaptable industry. Uh, and uh, it's going to face over the coming years increasing um, uh, criticism of not being uh, entirely green and so I think that creates a number of opportunities and we've we've certainly seen uh, steps being made already by, by market participants to uh, to to come up with inventive structures uh, carbon neutral LNG green LNG that we've seen you know the likes of pavilion and, and shell really really pursue with um, with great gusto and I, I think I think if everybody has a focus on that as a potential opportunity as well we can we can really bridge uh, even further that, that the, the role of gas and, and make it a, a much more green uh, alternative as we move towards a, a more renewable and sustainable future over the coming decades. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Mangesh? Actually, okay, I mean, if I have to give one key takeaway from this session, what I'll say is, I mean, the gas market liberalization initiatives are definitely good for, for the countries. It will mean that we will see new buyers emerging and it's a good opportunity for all these new emerging buyers to take advantage of the current buyers environment in the LNG market to try and extract better pricing and flexible terms. But at the same time, as Khairul had rightly pointed earlier, buyers will need to be realistic in their expectations and they will need to remember that any deal has to be a win-win for both parties. Thanks, Mangesh. Uh, Carol? Yep. Well, uh, definitely a good session for each of the panel and also Kunrani. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. So I guess when the takeaway that we're going to say is that uh, Southeast Asia is remain, uh, will remain prolific and will become one of the biggest market in the region. So uh, buyers and sellers needs to work in terms of uh, finding the best way to work forward and hopefully that can be achieved between Petronas and also EGAT and also other suppliers or even other buyers. That's certainly our aspiration. And uh, for Petronas, uh, just to have parting remark, uh, we are also go beyond the natural, traditional way of doing business now. Uh, this is to address the ever-growing changes in the market. We are looking into uh, other solutioning that uh, we are providing now in the market. We are talking about small scale. We are talking about uh, LNG bunkering, we are talking about ISO tanks. So those are the menus that we are offering in the market so that we are remaining, uh, so that the, the markets can also liberalise and also have an option. So I guess sometimes these are the things that uh, need required to be in the market. Uh, so then uh, buyers and sellers can have a space for their own to play and also to have a fine, uh, a very nice uh, space for them to make money. Again, thank you very much. That's cool. And lastly, but not least, uh, Kunrani, with some closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to sincerely say thank you very much for Kailu, Mr. Candace Paul, uh, and uh, the moderator case. Thank you very much. And uh, this is the, my honor to be speaker with all of you. And also thank you for the producer, Mr. Simon, for his dedicated and hardworking for the annual Asia Digital Series. So for the next episode, this will be held on December, right? I will be ECAT, the new code, the new cross exploration smart education solution for renewable energy. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much for all our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kun Rene. And I think that's a, a perfect time to draw to a close. Uh, 
and I do I must admit I, I loved some of the closing remarks you know from Paul we we are an inventive industry we need to continue to be so Mangesh around liberalization is great in the long term but also very important in the short term with the, the prices offering very competitive rates on the demand side and then Karul apart from making money I still like the good idea of you know Southeast Asia is prolific for a lot of us here and most importantly this continued theme of how we need to work together and partner together. So, so with that, again, I would like to thank the series sponsor, EGAT, and also the Ended Asia for putting this together. Um, thank you to my fellow speakers, um, Kunrani, Karul, Paul, and Mangesh. As always, very great insights from all of you. And then finally, in closing, just like to let our um, attendees know that as Kunrani alluded to, there will be the next episode in the series, and this episode will funny enough be looking at a lot of the questions we got today around renewable energy integration into the grid uh, this presentation or this panel will take place on the 3rd of december and registration is now open to that so on that regard i'd like to thank everyone and really appreciate your time today with us thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you.